Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have six yummy yellow chemicals. Now, even though all of these chemicals are quite pretty looking, you definitely don't want to eat most of them. So the first yellow chemical for today is benzoquinone. Benzoquinone forms beautiful yellow needles, and benzoquinone has a place in a lot of organic chemistry. So you can use benzoquinone for several purposes as an oxidant. For instance, you can turn over certain catalysts. If you need to reoxidize them, you can use benzoquinone to complete a catalytic cycle. Now, my personal favorite prep for benzoquinone is this patent here, example one. It works really well using hydroquinone, and you just treat it with iodine in the presence of H2O2, and you'll get really clean benzoquinone that you can just uh, filter out and wash with isopropanol. So the, the one issue with benzoquinone is oftentimes old samples don't work that well. I've had chemistry that has completely failed with commercial samples of benzoquinone, that likely just because they were older. I'm sure if you had a newer sample that was, you know, un unopened, it would work fine. But the, the stuff I've prepared myself has been superior in most instances. Now the next yellow chemical is actually a group of yellow chemicals, and that's thionoesters. So if you ever obtain a pure thionoester, they'll actually usually be yellow. Now I've got a couple exceptions here and there where they've been oranger or a little bit on the clearer side, and for the most part these things will be apparent, apparent as uh, oils. So you can see there's kind of like 50 shades of yellow here, maybe not quite 50, um, and one of them that's like just kind of barely yellow. But my favorite one is probably this solid, because most of the time when I prepared thionoesters, as I've prepared, you know, lots of thionoesters in my research, they've been oils. But there's been a couple exceptions where we've actually got solids. And so it was a pleasant surprise when this one came out as a solid, because even the benzyl analog without the two methoxy groups was actually an oil as well. And so the way that we prepare these is we just treat a methyl thionoester with an alcohol in the presence of sodium. Now, I've previously done a video on this, and I will include a link to that here. Now, one other thionoester that was quite beautiful, I decided to include two slides for this thio for thionoesters because of how beautiful this picture is, is this N-methyl-indole derivative with a 3-phenylpropanol ester portion. And so you can see this beautiful compound just grew out as one single crystal as like a starburst from the oil. And for a long time, this was my background on my phone because it's just such a beautiful, beautiful yellow compound. Um, absolutely gorgeous. So the third compound for today is diacetyl, and if you're not familiar with diacetyl, it's the flavor of microwave popcorn. It's actually present in butter in small amounts, as well as other dairy products, but as butter tends to age, there's a, a monohydroxy monoketone, um, alpha hydroxybutanone, and as it ages, it tends to form more of the diacetyl. Now, personally, I cannot tolerate the smell of microwave popcorn. I find it to be really overwhelming. Occasionally, people use diacetyl in chemistry as a photosensitizer, um, and it's also been used in butter-flavored vapes. This has caused people to get um, issues. Now, the, the main concern with vapes is actually due to vitamin E acetate, which is used in THC vapes occasionally, not in approved ones, but in ones that are not approved that other people have made. Now, the, the butter-flavored vapes would be in, like, nicotine vapes, and the issue with uh, diacetyl is even though you can eat it in food, it doesn't mean that it's safe for you to breathe it in. And that, that also goes for the vitamin E acetate. It's okay as a food ingredient, but it's not necessarily okay to breathe in large amounts of it. And so when people have worked with uh, diacetyl previously in factories, they've developed what's known as popcorn lung. And so this is, uh, you know, your classic buttery flavor. It's not real butter. And in my opinion, real butter always tastes better than uh, butter flavoring. You can let me know down in the comments if you disagree with that. So the way that diacetyl is made, made industrially, I thought I'd include this because it's just kind of interesting, is through the dimerization of um, ethylene. Once this butane uh, with a monoalkene butene, this is like a mixture of isomers usually, is formed, they can epoxidize it using a chlorohydrin. The chlorohydrin is then eliminated to generate the epoxide with, you know, various uh, stereochemistry. Because we're going to diacetyl at the end, it doesn't matter what the stereochemistry of these are. This is then opened to afford butane diol, 2,3-diol, uh, two, two, which is then oxidized to give us diacetyl. Now, the the next compound is potassium diethioformate. So this is kind of an obscure one. Previously on the channel, I talked about this compound spontaneously uh, igniting, and then I had to put it out with uh, ethanol to stop it from, uh, from really catching fire. I wouldn't quite say it was on fire, but it was smoldering, and this is just likely due to one of the impurities that is formed as the reaction occurs. 
Now, when we made this compound, we didn't end up doing any useful chemistry with it, but if you wanted to make inorganic complexes of diethylformate, that would be something that you could do. I think there's been a few reported in the literature previously. Um, also, this stuff smelled really terrible. Um, so the way that I made this is I just treated carbon disulfide with case electride. There's a couple other um, reductants which would work. I think superhydride also works for this reduction, um, but everything else we tried was super messy. So not a super useful chemical in our case, but it is still kind of pretty looking, even though it smells really awful. Now, the last compound is this interesting This interesting. Um, oxyme derivative. So if you haven't seen this before, you can see the crystals are quite beautiful. They look like they melt pretty close to room temp, so they look kind of wet. Um, this is a reagent developed by Patrick Fear. Um, he developed this reagent for the functionalization of pyridines. And so if you have a pyridine with like a CH in the two position of the pyridine, what you can do is you can activate the nitrogen by treating it with this chloro n sulfonyl or uh, O sulfonyl oxime. And uh, what this will do is it'll allow you to add in nucleophiles to the two position. And so the way that this reagent is prepared is initially what you do is you treat this, this um, oxime with NCS. This then uh, converts to the chloro oxime, which can then be treated with methyl chloride in the presence of triethylamine. This just affords the product in really high yield. So this is a really cool paper in JAX from 2017. I'd encourage you to go check it out. Uh, I think that this chemistry is a pretty good way to activate uh, pyridines. Normally you see other activation methods such as the use of N-oxides or uh, N-O acetyl derivatives. And so essentially just the way this works, as I was saying, is you activate the nitrogen and then you add in a nucleophile. Relatively straightforward and, uh, and the chemistry works pretty well in his case. Now in this last example here, we have bromine monochloride. As you can see here, bromine monochloride is this beautiful looking yellow gas. And you know, yellow gases are pretty terrifying, but I thought I should include one yellow gas in this episode. As we included a blue gas in the last episode, I will do the best of my abilities to uh, try and find a colored gas for whichever color of chemicals we are covering in that given episode. So bromine monochloride, pretty beautiful looking, but maybe not so yummy in terms of you don't really want to be eating it and you definitely don't want to be breathing it in. So the preparation of bromine monochloride is rather straightforward, at least in principle. The way that you do this is you treat bromine with chlorine and then you just have to carefully purify out the bromine monochloride. Now there's some patents talking about how to selectively isolate this uh, bromine monochloride in the presence of the chlorine and the bromine because you can imagine that you could have trace contaminants of the bromine or the chlorine respectively and that might affect some of the subsequent chemistry that you try and do with it which wouldn't necessarily be ideal in most cases but depending on your application it might not be much of an issue if you like the inclusion of gases in these videos make sure you let me know down below so that the next time I do a color chemical video I include even more. So with that, I'd like to thank you for watching this video. Uh, it's the viewership of viewers like you that makes it possible for me to keep making videos. If you do really want to support the channel, you can support us on Patreon, and it would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. If you haven't viewed the Discord yet, we have a growing Discord. At the time of uploading this, we have about 2,200 Discord members. That's 2,200 for those unfamiliar. And we regularly have fun events, and uh, it's a great place to talk about chemistry questions and just engage in the community. So it's a really fun place, and it would be really cool if a few more of you wanted to join. So with that, as per usual, I hope you have a great day.